I think game development is not just the core thing, it's the heart and soul of the company. Today I'm speaking with Unity CEO John Riccatello. We got to dive into what's going on at Unity, what's coming in the future, and really a lot about his thoughts on game development. It was a really fun and interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. And to be honest, I actually pitched this as something that I wanted to do to Unity. I said, hey, I would like to interview John about game dev stuff if he's ever got some time and interested. You know, I see he talks about business things all the time. I'd love to just talk about the actual development side and he was all in. I was totally surprised, but it was an amazing conversation. I had a lot of fun and I hope that you enjoy it too. If you have comments or questions, please drop them down below and hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. Thank you, John, for joining me. I'm really, really excited to talk to you, probably a lot more than you know or more than people realize in the audience. I, I've been watching a lot of your stuff recently and uh, kind of binging even on some of your talks. It's been kind of interesting and um, you know, also, of course, played a ton of EA games back in the day. So I thought about maybe coming on and just complaining about one because I thought it would be funny. But <laughs> I decided to we'll skip that and just get straight into some kind of important Unity related stuff. So you've been the CEO of Unity for quite a while now. It's been seven, eight years. Uh, and, yeah, um, um, back to 2014, so it's been a while. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been uh, quite a while. I remember when you first stepped into the role, um, my buddy Brad would talk about how excited he was about it and how he wanted to use Unity because you were there. He's like, oh, this John's awesome and it's going to be great. Um, so I, I was excited about it at the time, too. And I've seen a lot of kind of things grow and a lot of stuff change and you know unity's become went from a tiny little company to something that's relatively enormous now i'd say and as you've been kind of expanding you've been getting into a whole bunch of other industries getting into you know, digital i guess digital twin or I'll, I'll let you kind of dive into the details of it but you've been really expanding out into a bunch of different industries and i was curious um Sometimes I see developers or game developers freaking out a little bit like, oh, are they not, do they not care about games anymore? And I think obviously that's not the case, but I was curious what it is that you guys are doing um, internally to kind of keep game developers like right at the front of your mind, like as a, the core thing, or is that, I assume that is still kind of the core thing that Unity does, right? So <clears throat> I think game development is not just the core thing, it's the heart and soul of the company. So. And, and just a couple quick thoughts on that. I mean, the first one I'd offer is, um, and it may not be obvious to everyone, but you know, one of the comments that's made virtually every board meeting, and, and I've got a board meeting next week, is, um, you know, as gaming goes with Unity, so goes the company. So it's it's sort of um, a thesis, and when you hear us talk about the world's a better place with more creators, what, what I have in mind is, you know, back in the day, you know, years ago, um, in a development studio right across the street from Electronic Arts was Amicia Pizza, Amici's Pizza, Amicia's Pizza. And I can't remember the number of nights it was, you know, me just hanging out. I, I didn't code game, but I was a GM of a studio then, the Red Mature Studio. And just being up all night with these guys and gals. And it, honestly, mostly guys back then, I mean, it was, you know, Cheetos and pizza and long nights. And part of it was it just, we just wanted to make something amazing. And we kind of got anxious about, you know, the thing that we wanted to be amazing, if we could just get one more pass at it. And um, I've had so many experiences that are like that. It's It's been a deep passion of mine for a very long time. Um, and then what, what I think can be missed sometimes, and I kind of get it. Um, so working for me is, is Mark, who, you know, Mark Witten, who is the head of our create business, who, you know, essentially created Xbox Live, you know, deep background in gaming. Our whole organization, all the way through our create organization, is literally dominated by folks with a gaming background. And, you know, one point of evidence, Jason, is We've been averaging increases in investment against gaming 65% a year for the last years. And um, frankly, way more than the revenue would justify. And so we do it 
out of passion, out of faith in the notion the world's a better place with more creators in it. And when we think that, we really, in many ways, think the gaming creator. Now, of course, we have to do things to have a successful business so we can afford to do that kind of investment. And part of what I think you hear and can be taken as, you know, maybe focus on something else, is really focusing on the, the single notion that we need to have a successful company, a successful business, so we can to continue to double and triple down on, on gaming, which is what we do quarter in, quarter out, year in, year out. Personally, I really appreciate that because I think that like a lot of the time with game developers, they're not thinking about the business side of things in general. They're not thinking about how to make their game successful how to make a profit off of it or how to get a you know and that the game engines need to essentially do the same thing i remember back in the day you couldn't get into a game engine you had to essentially have a publisher or a couple million dollars to bribe a publisher to get them to let you use your engine and now there's all these companies around it and it makes a lot of sense that you're going to be growing and expanding and to be honest i've been researching a lot into what you guys have been expanding into and i'm really excited about it more excited after diving into it and kind of getting a deeper understanding of what it was that you guys kind of have in mind and um after watching that awe um keynote recently that kind of brought it even more to light so i guess um to follow up on that a little bit when you guys are doing the um, mergers and acquisitions, the stuff like grabbing Weta Digital, or I know you probably can't talk a lot about the current stuff that's in the in process right now, but um, how do you guys think about the developer community when when you're doing that? Do you have um, are you thinking like these, we're going to pull this stuff all in for developers? Is this like something that's kind of tertiary and that they shouldn't be thinking about too much, or is it like, where is it with that? I guess is the question. So um, we think very deeply about game developers when we think about our M&A strategy. Um, you know, things like, you know, Ziva and Speedtree are very much, you know, tools of the gaming world. Um, but frankly, you know, with, with, with most anything that you would acquire, if we were to acquire things, you, you kind of look at, is it better to build it or is it better to buy it? And in um, some markets, in some sectors, you know, there are, companies that you can afford to invest in and buy and make sense. And sometimes it's just easier and better to build it. And more often than not with gaming, it's earlier I said we increased our investment per year, it's about 65%. That's the investment in build. And you see us doing that, you know, on a number of things, whether it's, you know, net code investments we've been making, which are substantial, you know, what we've done around dots with the burst compiler and the job system. Um, you know, all the work around um, game objects, all the multiplayer investment, all the investment in workflows, um, you know, what we've done around, you know, allowing assets to load a lot faster um, versus where they were in 2020 LTS, what we've done around profiling, um, all the work on the rendering pipelines. I, I can go on for a while, but it, it, we can't easily buy a rendering pipeline and we can't buy workflows and improvements. and. Um, and so the, the investments have been more organic there. Um, but, you know, I think, Jason, one thing to, to say is that, like, I can understand, you know, the sentiment you said earlier when um, a developer might think we're focused on other things. If you think about it, we publish literally every week a huge amount for the game developer in, um, you know, through various mechanisms, whether it's a YouTube video or it is what we do with blogs or many other things we do on a website. But if they read the paper, right, they go back to, let's go back two years. They read about um, an IPO, right? They read about Weta. Um, you know, they read about, you know, what we announced with Iron Horse and the noise that took place with um, other things in and around that. Um, they read about, um, you know, cost reduction that we took earlier in the year. And it's really easy to say, well, those must be the important things. They're in the newspaper I read and they're in Twitter. And honestly, they're not the important things. It's what the civilian journalist writes about. And um, I think that's our fault. And I think we need to do a lot more on communicating. Remember, communication is a two-way street. A big part of that's listening. 
But I think we got some work to do on communications. I think we let that happen, not through commission, but through omission. And I think that was a mistake. Oh, I think that's that's very fair, and uh, the, it's a good observation because it's. I think people go for the the big clickbaity titles and the clickbaity. You know, the, if there's a billion dollar anything, then it's a newsworthy, right? If it's got a B after it, like it's a news title. The fact that you added some awesome new feature or some new functionality, made some big improvements, those are like there are all these minor little things that all add up to. But they're the things that actually matter day to day. So when people asked me personally about, you know, if I cared about all of these changes or all of these things, you know, if the merger happens, are you going to quit using Unity? Like, of course not. It's going to make zero impact on me day to day, like maybe long term, it'll have some positive impact on revenue or some other insights, which I actually kind of learned quite a bit about in the last couple of days too. So um, can you share a little bit about just your vision for Unity for the next like five to 10 years, where you'd like it to go, what you see like the, the grand vision for Unity or gaming in general? So um, I started by saying this is all about creators. Um, the world's a better place with more creators in it. You hear that from us a lot. And that gaming is the heart and soul of the company. So let me start there. Um, I want for a day where a creator can come to Unity regardless of skill levels and realize what they want to make and in particular in gaming. They can make what they have in their mind's eye, you know, what their ambition is. And, and in fact, it can be better than they might have dreamed about. It sort of surprises them with capabil capability when, rest, when appropriate, visual fidelity, uh, great and easy and intuitive, intuitive workflows, um, you know, smart tools around, you know, version control, et cetera, so people can work in teams effectively. Um, it's extensible, covers the platform without a thought. Multiplayer, when a player indicates or a de developer indicates that they're building something for multiplayer, there's an enormous amount of complexities that are introduced when they are going to build for multiplayer, and they just work. Um, you know, beyond that, I would say, um, you know, so sort of the center of this thing is. Me Look, there's about 50 million people that create for YouTube every month. Similar amount for TikTok, half that or something similar for Instagram. Um, there's a lot of people that seem like they want to be creators. I've never met, well, I've rarely met anybody under 25 that doesn't say they want. They wish they could make a game. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's every single person, I got dozens of nephews and nieces, they all want to make a game. Most of them have tried. So I want to make that easy. I want to make that now brilliance is never easy so you know i can't i don't make you you know leonardo by giving you a set of paints but i want to give you really capable paints really capable tools so you can make anything you can imagine um, if you bring brilliance you'll get brilliance now beyond that um you know i want that to extend to other industries because when we work in other industries you know the digital twin stuff for example we have to do work there around technologies like ray tracing or systems that enable a, a gigantic, huge file, you know, that might some days count into petabytes, can be sized appropriately to the device that you're, you're using to, to, to play or render. So we want to be able to do a lot of those things that we learn from other industries, like film is another industry where we learn from and a lot of the what it's rules that do amazing things in film can be brought into the gaming industry. But we want to enable all of those folks to find success too, back so we can learn, get better, and deliver better for our game developers and then developers beyond. But the second part of it, the second part of our vision, is enabling business success. Now, I am fully cognizant of the fact that um, a lot of people build games with nothing more in mind than the joy of building games. You know, my my uh, my younger daughter is um, she likes to code. She, she blows glass. She does a lot of stuff. But when she was going through middle school and high school, we built games together, and we certainly had no expectation that um, she'd find anything commercial in that. She just wanted something she could play with dad, 
And I wanted something that would help her get a good grade in her class, but also, you know, give her the permission to believe she could be a creator. Um, and mission accomplished. There was nothing about a commercial outcome in that. But regardless of your goal, um, I want to make sure that we, let me pause for a second. When an independent developer has never made a game before, suddenly has a game, and maybe it's designed to be multiplayer, maybe it's single player, maybe it's something that gets augmented you know, with, with some online services, whatever it is they've built. They suddenly show up on the scene, they want to put this thing in the marketplace, and they end up with SDK soup. They need you know, a server, they need a system for updating the content. Um, they might need analytics, they might need you know, help with IAP, they might need voice, they might need matchmaking, they might need a lot of things, you know, hosting, serving, streaming. They might need AI if you're using it for rendering it or for some sophisticated purpose inside their game. Um, it's a shock to first-time developers just how much complexity lives in, in all of that. And so whether it's success or solving for complexity or just making it possible to share a game with your friends, I want to make sure that we provide that too. So you, you could compare Unity, I guess, to other tools companies, say like an Adobe. But when you use Photoshop, right, it doesn't necessarily need to be hosted or streamed or analyzed or, I mean, you could share it as a, an attachment to an email or, or, you know, you can send it in a message. It's not, it doesn't require a whole operational background and complexity. We make things, you make things, if you're a, a game creator, that is real-time, 3D, interactive, and enormously dynamic that needs to be updated and adjusted when iOS changes their, their system or Android changes or PlayStation changes or Xbox changes or Steam changes a rule or you know Windows puts out new drivers or, or my friend Jensen from NVIDIA puts out a even more powerful GPU that might be the size of a small car by the time this happens. <laughs> and so when all those things happen, we need to be ready for those things and your content needs to be ready for those things. And so I wanna basically ensure that we cover the other side of it. So when you ask about you know, my vision in, for Unity, I think that the most pervasive form of entertainment in the world today is, is gaming. You know, when I got started, we were smaller than radio. Radio was smaller than recorded music and whatever, the record industry, which was smaller than TV, which was smaller than film. And we were way down in the pecking order. We're now at the top of that heap. And I think we're going to be even more pervasive than we are today, even more than the nearly 4 billion people per month will be playing games. And they'll be playing more. And lots of industries, like film, are going to gamify. So it's all coming our way. And in a world where all of that is going to happen, I want to make sure that we're the, the best, safest, um, surest way to realize your vision for what you want to make and that we can help support all the complexity around whatever your ambition is to um, share a game with your sister or to publish it to 300 million people. We want to be able to support you with that. I think that's pretty exciting, personally. Um, uh, getting new people into game development is a big passion of mine too, so it might be why, but like, for me that's that's really exciting, just the idea of getting people in, getting them to be able to build what it is that they have in their mind a lot easier. I always think of like the the end goal 100 years down the road being like a, a Star Trek holodeck, where it's kind of like walk in, tell the computer what it is that I want, and it just kind of does it. <laughs> like, and that's all I got to do. <laughs> like, but I think that we're, we're kind of on that path, at least. Yep. <laughs> Not quite there, but on the path. <laughs> so uh, on the, the next thing I was curious about is, um, Something that I, I, oh, I'm not wearing it right now. I was wearing my one of my Unite shirts, but uh, I just took it off because it was too hot. But it's something that pops up all the time, and it's um, 
well, something that's been big on my mind. And I'm curious, is there going to be some sort of other, a new Unite event or some other events where people can kind of get together with Unity developers and talk to people? In the past, um, at least in the LA area, there used to be a lot of meetups with you know, Unity evangelists. And then there was all the, the great Unite events, which I really love. I wear the shirts almost <laughs> like I, I wear them back to back. And I, I'll never forget the universe studios one <laughs> that was a uh, probably the, the craziest but they're really great events being able to just talk to other developers and talk to the team directly um, is extremely useful so I was curious if that's something that's happening again sometime soon now that the world's kind of going somewhat normal again so absolutely I mean um, my first interaction serious interaction um, with unity long before I joined was uh, at a United event um, up in Canada so um, I, I just loved it when I was there, and it, it actually is what got me in, involved as a board director and then joining the company as an employee. And, you know, and by the way, years before that, I was pretty close to their first commercial customer. So I go back a long time with the company. But to answer your question directly, I think there's nothing like in-person interaction with people. In fact, I think a lot of the brittleness in the world today is a consequence of, you know, people finding slack and twitter or an email and whatever else being their mechanism of communication versus face to face and just talking to each other so this november we're going to do a hybrid version of um unite where we will have people into our offices in key markets like san francisco copenhagen seoul montreal uh, but next year we're going to come back with the full in-person unite um the it's just too great not to do it. And to be honest with you, while I interact with a fair number of developers, I learned so much from just being there and you know joining the sessions and watching what they ask questions about. It's just better than you know blogs and social media for that purpose. The the other thing is um, there are Unity um, user groups in almost every major city in the world. And you know, one of the things that I, I want to really invest in as we come out of um, come out of sort of COVID hibernation is those uh, those communities um, put a lot more of our evangelists in those spaces, organize around the grassroots of our industry because I think that's it's just To, to describe social media or even blogs as two-way communication overstates the case. It's sort of like parallel monologues. And it's really hard to learn from a parallel monologue. And we try hard, and I, I spend time one-on-one with developers to try to learn. But I, I want us, me and everyone at Unity to engage in these um, user groups and unite and build out other forms for face-to-face -face communication. Now, we've got literally hundreds of Unity engineers working inside our customer game developers, whether they're, you know, most of them are on LTS, so they're just trying to build a game and get it out. And some of them are on various deeply experimental technologies. And um, so we learn a lot from that, but that's more like, you know, five or 8% of our people that are like living with, creators it's not the same as I mean, and i can't do that i have another company i gotta live with called <laughs> unity and um and while i visit it's not it's, it isn't the same so i want to and i want to get more exposure and i want everybody here at unity to get more exposure like we had pre-covid but maybe even more so nice well, i think that'll be really exciting i mean personally the unite event sounds really really exciting get to learn a lot and for me there are two great parts of those that get to learn or get to meet a lot of people kind of interact with and get a lot of that two-way communication i've met a lot of developers who are doing crazy stuff and made a lot of friends uh, at unite events but also i found that they always tend to be very actionable like i learn a lot of things about the new stuff that's coming in unity and the ways that i can integrate and use that i've i never went to a unite event without like having something some task like by the time i left that i needed to go implement or try to put into our game or see if it was going to fix as always i just come back with something that i could use and a lot of the time i'd be doing it like at the lunch break and i'd see other people just sitting down and like oh i wanted to try this thing out that i saw in the session so uh, I, i'm asset store companies companies that are building things that 
you know, they may not have big companies, a lot of, you know, single person companies and three person companies and five person companies that make a, a really cool tool or a different approach to particle effects or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, you know, a lot of them will attend Unite and find an audience for what they're doing. And I think that ecosystem of creators, you know, we're very thankful to have them. And obviously our community developers are very thankful to have them because they certainly use them in, in huge measure. So that's another part of what is so hard in a virtual world and is so easy in a physical world. Yeah, I find it's a lot easier to build those relationships and talk things through when you're in person and stuff than it is when you're trying to just send a message online or an email or something or a text with no tone and context and things get totally misconstrued or confused. So I don't know, I, I'm really excited about this though. And so speaking of new features, are there any new features that are, you guys are working on in Unity that are gonna be really exciting for developers that you'd be interested or willing to share today? Uh, they, they always hate when the CEO front runs stuff and we're in that mode right now where we're about, what is it, November 1 from now, like 10 weeks to maybe I did the math wrong, nine weeks, but where we got stuff to announce and like you sort of semi embargo that stuff. But I'll, I'll tell you a lot of what we are spending our time and energy on right now. Um, one of the things we're spending a lot of time and energy on is basically st stability, performance, reliability, the stuff that is the you know workflows, the things that are bread and butter to any developer. The second area of huge focus is netcode multiplayer. Um, if you go back a few years ago, um, you know, mobile, for example, very few games are really multiplayer, and that number is increasing like logarithmically. And so um, we need to support that. Now, another area of focus, um, an area that I think um, we may have gotten wrong initially in terms of sort of commercializing it almost before it was ready was DOTS, our data oriented technology stack. But I was very pleased to see, I think it was in May, Last time I looked at the Steam charts, two out of the top 20 PC titles were DOTS. Um, 14 out of 20 or 13 out of 20 were Unity. I was happy to see that, but I was surprised that two out of that 13 were, were DOTS titles. And so it seems like our developers have almost taken it further, further than we would have anticipated as quickly as they have. And I think we need to continue to provide support there. But a lot of net code, um, multiplayer, matchmaker support, uh, basic stability, uh, UI is super important to us right now. Um, we, as, as I think I mentioned this before, but we're doing a lot around optimized performance around asset loading and, and then also some things that can help help a developer figure out how to get performance out of the game with a profiler suite. Those types of things are, are good emphasis for us right now. And um, I cannot tell you that you know, we're always working on uh, visual capabilities and fidelity. Um, you know, getting our, our render pipelines as, as good as they can, getting for the artists more the scriptable processes where they can a little bit easier to interact with. Um, but um, you know, we've got two main render pipelines and you know, universal render pipeline is getting you know, a lot of adoption now. It didn't initially have the adoption we would have hoped. Um, that's coming and we're pushing more on the high definition render pipeline. But again, I think some developers, you know, think we're, we, we had more work to do there and they're right. And, you know, so there's big emphasis there. And of course, one thing that we have incumbent on us that may not be all that obvious, a lot of hardware companies will speak to us a year to sometimes three years before hardware platforms coming to market. And sometimes, you know, 18, 24 months before the developers know a hardware platform is coming to market. Because, you know, if you ship hardware without the ability to build for it, you're shipping a doorstop. So it's got to, I mean, it might be a very expensive doorstop, but it's got to have, you know, the support of a development community. So um, I've got good insight on what's coming next from who, and some of that stuff's exciting too, but we don't get to make those announcements. That, that is really exciting. That's got to be really neat being in there and seeing the, the inside view of like the future and, and what's coming. And I kind of saw, I, I got a little insight into that watching, like I said, a lot of your videos recently that it seemed like you kind of knew what was coming in advance a lot of the time in the past. Like, and it's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised. So 
I, I guess the the last thing I really wanted to ask you about was what you're seeing that develop because you're talking about dots and you know these developers really pushing the edge. Are you seeing like some really cool things that developers are doing with Unity right now, or what? What's probably the coolest thing that you've seen, uh, maybe with Unity and just in gaming in general? Like the game, I'm I'm kind of curious like where you're at with that. What do you see that's really amazing? Like what what excites you? I see things that excite me all the time, but I feel like I'm easily excited. <laughs> like, well, I mean, I saw that top five headset and it blew my mind. You know, like everything excites me. <laughs> so I, you know, I I'd, I'd mention you know. God, I can go on for a while on this one. So, um, you know, one is, you know, just think like some of the indie developers that are out there, um, the guy that made Falconeer, uh, Thomas Sala, he's got a, a city building game that he's putting out right now. Um, you know, they, I don't know if, if you track Sakura Rabbit, who's uh, somebody that a lot of Unity devs follow. Um, she, she's got this thing that I saw on Twitter that is um, like a breathing torso. And I mean, it's it's insane. It looks so incredibly cool. I mean, I clicked through the link off of her off her tweet, and um, you know, she's clearly I don't know what she's doing to be honest, because this is the first time I saw it. But she's clearly working with our you know high def render pipeline, every shader that's ever been invented, lighting. She's after something there um, that 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 you know pretty darn cool. Um, you know, there's a thing out there of it's. Um, called Neon White that I reference it because I'll give you another reference and I hate to reference an Unreal game, but I will. One of my favorite games of all time that I ever worked on was the original Mirror's Edge that came out of our you know, you know EA studio in, in Stockholm. It is a, a little hard to play and nothing was perfectly intuitive and I fell off a few buildings. Um, but between art style, the overall ethos of the game, the, it was beautiful, the music was amazing. Anyway, the, um, this reminds me a bit of that. And so, you know, there's certain favorites of mine, and, you know, whether it's Grim Fandango, this, you know, going back to, you know, Doom and things I played before that. When they remind me of things that I like, you know, this is one that reminds me of things that I like. And then, you know, it's Gamescom this week, and, um, you know, we've got a, you know, they're voting for the next, you know, indie. We're doing a, uh, a competition right now. I'd have to look at what's in this one, but. The nominees were uh, Figment 2, Creed Valley, Bedtime Digital Games, met from Danish group, AKA Aka Cosmogato. I don't actually know what that is. I haven't downloaded that yet. So the game is um, Aka, which looks, um, somebody on our team must love it. I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, there's a team coming out of uh, China called Back to the Dawn. Um, there's a game out of the US, uh, Madison Carr, which is a game called Birth. Um, and so, obviously, I'm, I'm watching with bated breath. I just saw the list yesterday. I'll try to get to, um, I'll try to get to a couple of them, um, you know, by the weekend. Um, you know, obviously, you no know more downloading something and playing it than you do reading it off of a, a list of nominees. So I'll kind of get through that. Um, some other things I've seen that was, you know, really cool, and I, maybe Jason, we can share it to you offline. Some really interesting work being done around um, AI and machine learning for content creation that some of our teams are, are working on right now and some really complicated and interesting transformations, but also just some just amazing effects that people are, you know, getting, they're teasing some performance um, out of things that, you know, I never would have thought possible. And so I'm excited about that. Um, of course, there's the you know, the stalwarts that we always like to see, you know, people like, you know, Call of Duty Mobile, um, you know, super important game built in Unity continues um, to look gorgeous and do what it does, Honor of Kings in China. It, you know, it's a, one of the top grossing games in, in history, con, you know, continues. Um, you know, so, you know, old and new, there's um, a lot that, that excites me. I think, I wish I could tell you about a couple of our, um, Studio partners, um, there's a, I don't know if you call it AAA or quadruple A game being built by a studio that I'm very close to, that we support very closely. I think we're under embargo on talking about it until early next year, but it's something that I've had a chance to get a good, good close look at. 
And one of the things that I'm always challenged with in interviews is I don't always remember the line between what I'm supposed to talk about and what I'm not supposed to talk about. Um, I know what I've seen and what I haven't seen. That part's easy. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't have permission on that one right now. So um, all in all, there's always so much, you know, coming, you know, that's being built in unity that it's hard not to be excited all the time. It, it's genuinely an honor to be in a space like this where you get to see so much and so much creativity that it kind of blows you away. Uh, well, hopefully we can talk about some of these other ones in the future when they're uh, not <laughs> under embargo. I, I really envy uh, all the stuff that, that you're seeing and uh, like being able to be view in your brain. I think it would be it would be super exciting. Um, I, I did have one other question. I just remembered. So um, you mentioned that like you were one of the early early adopters of Unity, um, and I know that you really like to use and like get in and know your products really well. It seems like that's kind of, from what I gathered, it seems like one of your core principles is really understanding it and knowing your product. So I was just curious, do you get the opportunity to jump into Unity very often anymore? Is it something that you get to do, um, just hop in and have fun every now and then? <laughs> how, how often do you, do you get that fun? Well, um, hmm. You know, some years ago, I mean, maybe last, maybe four or five years ago, I built I built a number of very simple things in Unity. Um, when it comes to being a direct creator, you wouldn't count me as a direct creator. Um, you know, for a while, a year and a half, I stepped into the role of the GM of the Red Ridge Horse Studio, you know, at Electronic Arts, where, you know, we built a number of titles, you know, there, Matt and came out of the studio and um, paddles like, you know, we, the first Tiger Woods Golf and things like that. But that was more of a management leadership role. So no one would confuse me with being a hands-on creator. Um, I was, when I was in college, I learned Pascal. I wrote some very simple MUDs. Um, and I, using Aston Script, helped my daughter build some, some game titles when titles wouldn't even go that far. Game experiences, I don't know what's lighter than a title. Um, so, um, I'm kind of a weird, weird admixture of a, a product guy, uh, a gamer, a business leader, or hopefully try to be a business leader, a team builder, and um, and I certainly get to see a lot from my development organization at Unity what they're working on, how it looks in the editor, how they're trying to manage workflows, etc. But I think I'd disappoint you if you were looking for some of my recent work in the um, in Unity. Oh no, I w I'm just excited when I see managers that like know and understand their products and like actually have used it in the past. I don't expect them to be the best programmers. I expect them to know like what the engine we're using is, how it works, and, and those core things. So I find that it, it makes a big, big difference. At least, you know, maybe it's different on the on the other side, but in the game game studios, and I'm sure you, you know, obviously you've been <laughs> ahead of one of the biggest, but in game studios, I feel like it's really always been the, the big differentiator between a good manager and a not great manager is that the ones that are really good really understand both the game and the the process around it. They know what everybody is doing and they've they've kind of gone through that process and they, they learn it and you know do the research and, and get to know it. So I, well, I think I that it's super you, valuable. I, I would say that you know one of the things is that um, I my my view would be um, to expand on it a little bit. If you're a game developer or a game publisher, you really need to know what players want because your job is to satisfy players. And if you build game tools, your job is to know what a developer wants and needs. And um, if I could commit to anything to this development community is that we are nearly 7,000 strong and we're all here to listen. Um, we can't necessarily look over your shoulder um, when you're building, but um, we are very committed to listening. And because I work inside of a development and publishing organization, I've got a, some grip on that, but it's far from a 
perfect understanding. And of course, there's a breadth of different kinds of developers out there. The you know, very small indies trying to do something 2D and simple, and um, other 2D isn't necessarily simple. Or you know, people trying to build build mammoth, you know, AAA products that you know massively multiplayer or otherwise. So the the range of expectations is very high. But we're here to listen. Yeah. Well, my experience with Unity has been pretty much that that they've been super responsive um, as a game developer and with the game developers that I talk to all the time. It seems that the the team you have there is very good at getting back to people, helping them through issues, and really just making it easier to be a game developer. So I guess I wanted to say thank you for leading that team and thank you to the entire team over there too because the entire Unity team is freaking amazing, and at least in my view. And I really wanted to thank you just for taking the time to talk to me. This is amazing, not something that I expected was going to happen, so I'm blown away and really, really thrilled to talk to you. I hope sometime we could talk again about um, Metaverse stuff too because that... <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Jason. Thank you very much.